I tell you, I just love walking around coming in because I, I can definitely feel a different vibe at this conference than I felt at any other government function that I've been in. What a wonderful lead off by Cameron Holt, who I can tell you I am super excited as our head of contracting while I'm in this job. Now, how often do you see someone that can take the details of what's happening day to day in the field and roll it all the way back up to the strategic level? And I really want to thank Wendy and, and Charlie and Daryl. Thank you for being here. I think that says something to the wider group here that you are still connected and passionate about this part of the Air Force. There's a lot of stuff that we should talk about. And what I'm going to do is try to go through a few things that I'm worried about, thinking about, try to enlist your help to solve some problems. But I really want to hear from you. I want to give you time to ask questions. Don't worry that we're live. Don't hold back. Ask whatever it is that you need to know so that you can do your job better. So Cameron started off with what every talk should begin with, what every conference should begin with, what every meeting should begin with in the Air Force, and that is why. My biggest frustration working in the Pentagon is that we lack that, that so many meetings jump into the process or the banalities of the system that we have to work with, the 5,000, the FAR, or a process which seems to be king, an organizational restructure which seems to be king. But we miss why. And the why is always the warfighter. And the warfighter in acquisition is not just who we support in the field today. And that matters. For, for those of you who have had the chance to support an acquisition or do contingency contracting directly impacting people in the field that have to do mission today, I'm going to guess that's some of the most satisfying work that you've done in the business. Show of hands. Yeah, me too. Me too. That's what lit me on fire for this business. As a scientist who's used to seeing things happen over long periods of time and never know if what you're working on will have any practical value in the world, this business is electric. Being able to do something that keeps someone safer, makes them more lethal, makes them more efficient, any of those things are the experiences that bring us into this business and keep us here. And we've got to do more to give our young acquisition professionals that experience early, to give a whole talk on that. So if you've done that, that's focusing on the current warfighter. But as we start thinking about competing with great powers, just like Cameron led off with today, we're competing for the future warfighter. How we do business today and tomorrow and tomorrow for decades determines whether that future airman has the world's best air force or one that's on par with another country's. There's very little value in the future that I can see for the world's second best air force. What would you do with it? Like we have become accustomed to having an air force so dominant that anyone that's on the ground or on the sea never has to fear a, a threat from the air. And if we can't bequeath that to the future generation, that it isn't. there's no telling how future wars would evolve. It would fundamentally change the model that has been given to us from the last century into this. So we can't. We can't let that happen. I don't want to create a new playbook for how the war is going to go. But if we want to do that, we are going to need a new playbook in how we compete for that future warfighter. And that's something that I, I can see in the Pentagon in these meetings where we're focusing on process. When you throw the threat of the warfighter, it's hard to be that stickler for rules that don't matter. It's hard to be the stickler for that process step that someone is in charge of that might feel slighted if we skip it. We are stealing time and energy and resource from that future warfighter. Everything has to focus on that. And I can tell you, folks, I'm excited, really excited, with what the Air Force has been capable of. Just in the 13 months that I've been here, like A+, plus, A++, plus plus, if I'm allowed to get another, the Air Force can take a lot of change. And the change is really just about inviting people to focus on the threat and to focus on who's going to have to face it and invite them to be part of the movement to speed up to do things faster, to do things better. Not because they're a talking point. It's not a talking point. 
right? This is a real reality that we live in. And if you don't think that I believe it, that I mean it, that is why I'm here. I am not here to punch a time card in a Pentagon job. I'm here because I want to be on your team. I am here because I see the threat. It's my job working for the Secretary of Defense, and I was in OSD to try to look at the threat and look at what our warfighters need to have to be able to, to dominate and win. So now being invited to do it at a larger scale in the Air Force, I'm here because I'm worried, but I'm also excited. And how we choose to rev up our acquisition engine is going to determine which side of the roof we go down, the worried side or the excited side. And if we don't, if we don't bequeath the world's fastest acquisition system to the future Air Force, we'll be going down the worried side, no matter what platforms we're building no matter what technologies we're using. And that's because the way in which technologies enter the world has changed. It's very easy to jump to the threat that we face, and we should. We should always focus on that instantiation of power that will be faced by the future Air Force. But in many ways, threats like China and Russia are, are wind socks that, that are manifesting something bigger. That there's a wind that is driving things, which is bigger than the particular countries. And if you, if you ask me what it is, and I'm still getting my thoughts together as well, I think it's just the way technology enters the world is now different. The Cold War model simply would not apply to the way that technology is produced today. So let's go back to Cameron Holt's F-22 example. That was a period where most new technologies came from the U.S. government. We like to talk about the computer, the microprocessor, the internet, all of that being birthed inside of government labs, inside of DARPA, created on government nickel. And now you can see that, that those and satellites and this whole, this whole slew of technologies have now commercialized and have created the internet of things and the world's a better place. So rarely hear that, hear that touted, that the military has spurned a whole new ecosystem of innovation in the commercial world. But we've generated a whole new ecosystem of innovation in the commercial world that generates technology on its own. You have to read every day to keep up with where technology is headed. And not just in one or two fields, it's everywhere. Like AI, barely keep up with just reading that, so many researchers and universities and startups and large companies like Google and Facebook are pushing that technology. We will not influence it very much. So we have to be able to ride the wave. What about technologies we tend to not talk about in defense? Things like biology, biotech. It's crazy. It's crazy what's coming. Where computer science and biology are now starting to marry up Technologies like CRISPR gene editing, which I read it, and it's sci-fi to me. But it's, it's opening up new possibilities for the future, which could be so disruptive. Because it's like copying off Mother Nature's tests. You get to basically jump ahead and use technology in the bio world that you couldn't make from first principles. It could be a disruptor. And national security implications will be dire. What about quantum systems? Right? We hear that a lot. Quantum computing, quantum entanglement, quantum communications. Yes, that could be a game changer, having processing move at a fundamentally faster level. All of that is being driven outside of the Air Force and the government. So the F-22 model, technologies on the inside, you're working on stealth technology, you're working on the AESA for the, uh, for the radar, you're working on weapons technology. You effectively have five technology programs that come together in one platform. And when you put that platform on the chess board, or maybe in this case the Go board, you've changed the game. But that took place over decades. And you could predict the cadence in, of moves because you understood the pace at which technology would mature. We could look at where we were versus the Soviet Union and say, we think that by the time we finish and we put this into the world, it's a disruptor that will not be beaten easily because the time it will take the Soviet Union to build something of the same caliber is so long that we will be on to the next thing and we'll have changed the game again. The technologies that are going to change the future are mostly 
not going to be created by us. And that idea of having a first mover advantage that then gives you time to work on your second move because your adversary is responding to what you've done is now broken. The whole acquisition system that we have that likes to forecast what the threat is going to be and then build a system to beat it is now invalid. See, if I came to give you a talk on the 2030 threat, who would believe me? Do you think that anyone can really predict with all of these technologies what the world is going to be like 10 years from now? No. Well, when I look at our system, our system needs to know that threat. And now that threat is unknowable just due to all the permutations. That is what this huge plethora of technology is going to do to national security is create so many options that they're not predictable. So what do we do? Give up, throw our hands up and say, well, good run while it lasted. You know the other side of the story. Guys, let's get excited. Let's not do the worry side. That's the, that's the bad side of the, of the slope. Let's go down the other way. The other side of the slope is excitement. All of these technologies are available for us too. Any one of these things could be a game changer for a platform that we're building. Could take a technolo technology to a new level when doing combinations or bringing a commercial technology to bear with a military technology. But, but if we want to have the advantage, we have to be able to ingest it, use it, and field it faster than the opponents we face. Right? Just imagine like, time, like playing, like it's like playing speed chess. If you're not a chess player, speed chess is completely different than playing a normal game of chess. It's about being able to make good moves in a little bit of time, as opposed to being able to make perfect moves taking more time. You're really playing the clock. The person on the other side of the board is interesting, but the clock is the real enemy. And usually in speed chess, if you can make pretty good moves really fast, you will beat better players who make perfect moves that take longer. Because when time's up, time's up. Whoever is able to make the most moves in their time wins. That's the paradigm shift. We have to be able to make moves faster, which means everything that we do has to speed up. So that no matter what the technology is, if AI hits another level in five years where it's auditable and you can ask it questions and we can trust it more, then we've got to be able to move and get it fielded faster than any other opponent. Because if we can't, then our future airmen, the ones that we are competing for today, may face a country, may face an adversary that can. And we are accustomed to being the surprisers, not the surprised. So is it possible to do this shift, to change the way we buy things to compete and win? Of course. And I want to share a few thoughts of, of what I think we have to do to put together a strategy that closes. You can't just say speed up. You have to have a basis for thinking that you can. You have to have a sense of what you need to work on and a sense of how you're going to pay for it. And I, uh, I'll give you some thoughts, but I want to hear yours as well. So push back, ask questions. We've got to get this right. But before I go through the specific areas that I think we need to focus, let me tell you why I'm excited about this as I am. If you read any of the things I put out to the workforce or hear me talk, if you, if, if you hear nothing else, know that I am passionate and urgent for this mission. But it's because of all of you. And I know that is such a common talking point from senior leadership. You have amazing people, and it almost sounds like you can see it written on their talking points, drafted in their speeches, and you don't believe they really believe it. If you don't hear anything else from my talk, I believe in the talent in this workforce. I believe in delegating authority to the lowest possible level. I believe in taking risk to a higher echelon and protecting people that have smart failures. I believe that because I have seen more talent in the Air Force than any other organization I've worked with. In industry, you bet on talent. 
In our operational Air Force, commanders delegate to the lowest possible level, because if you can execute commander's intent there, you've got a faster OODA loop than your, than your opponent. We are now going to mirror that in acquisition and why the talent is here to support it. If you go back through the materials, not that you should, I don't recommend you do this, but if you were to go back through all of the questions, all of the questions that I was asked coming in for confirmation, you are not going to see a theme about going fast in any question I answered. This strategy, going fast, like trying to speed up, delegating, trying to steal time back from the enemy is a lousy strategy if there's not a talented team that you can trust to do it. There's so much talent in our Air Force that if we don't trust it and get out of its way, then we're going to lose, not because we faced a superior adversary, we're going to lose because of us. And that, that is not acceptable. So before I go into these areas and talk about authorities and cool things that are happening because of people like you, just know that I mean this. I am your evangelist in the Pentagon, that senior leadership do not add value to almost any very specific or technical decision. We are overhead. We can do useful things like create tools for you. But when we start pretending that we're expert, that we need to show you in a review that we've got a lot of experience and I'm going to keep asking questions until I get you, then we're doing the very thing that kills momentum, that puts enthusiasm in the ashtray, that makes people think, I need to punch out and get out of this business because we're not focused on the threat of the warfighter. And the reason I am comfortable pushing things down is because I learn something every day from someone briefing me and I think, wow, that's a really great idea, and I see it everywhere. So the potential for something huge is here. Don't let the negative voices in your organization, they're, all, they're always there. Don't listen to them. Everything you've ever been told about change in government is wrong. And I can tell you why. I see it so often that when there's a problem in government, the answer is a new organization or a new process, or a new whatever it is. And I've never seen that work. The real thing to focus on is culture. And you've got it in spades. Just the excitement here. Culture's here. Well, what is a culture? Well, it's a hard thing to define. But industry would say it's having, it's having a strategic, unambiguous mission. Creative people aligned to a common goal that is somehow tra trackable or measurable. It's not just when, it's something below that. And in the world of acquisition, there are so many things that we measure to help us understand, are we competitive? So it's having that goal. It's having people that are able to, in their job, do things to help move the organization towards that goal. Every person can see their place in achieving something that is bigger than all of us individually. And finally, and this is an area that we can improve, it's a reward system that, that rewards people when they take those steps, not penalizing people when they take risk. And that's an area that we can do better. You put those three, th those three things together, you've got a culture. Culture is what does change in industry, and it's what is doing change in, in the Air Force. I see it when I go places. I see the excitement. I see people that are energized to make decisions because for once they are actually empowered to do it. So what I invite you to do is no matter what you're doing, think about culture every day. If you are leading a team, what are you doing to create it? What are you doing to empower it? Is the mission you've given them unambiguous? Ambiguity kills momentum. You've got to be laser focused on a target that everyone agrees is the direction they want to go. Create that culture beneath you. Every day I worry about it. I worry about giving talks like this. I do. Because the thing I worry so much about is how do I convince you? I can't meet you all. I can't come sit down and walk through your programs as much as I would like to be able to do it because I would learn a lot. 
How do I convince you to buy it? It's a tough question, and there's no answer. I don't have it yet. All I know is you've got to keep pumping energy into the system because the bureaucracy will take it out. Create the culture below you. Because if we get that right and we empower it, the talent is here to do anything, to compete against anyone. And I think eventually, we won't be talking about competing against adversaries, we'll just be competing against ourselves. You'll want to beat your past record. Set a new boundary condition for the Air Force that someone after you will say, I can beat that and I will. So I wanted to foot stomp that because it's so easy to jump into the authorities and the cool things happening and not understand that this is underwritten and bankrolled by you. So let's talk a little bit about what we need to do. Well, speed is something that you hear uh, everyone talk about a lot. I think it's the most important thing in acquisition. It was a fight for us in the Pentagon not to make it speed and, you know, I want you to be fast, and I want you to be lower cost, and I want you to be secure, and I want you to... And a lot of arguments over don't do that because when I hear that, I don't hear anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, who wouldn't want to be fast? Who wouldn't want a lower cost? Who wouldn't want to be secure? Where is your priority, Air Force? I will argue our priority has been on cost. Right, we track it a hundred different ways. You probably think it's not enough. We maybe track it more than that. <laughs> I think it's fundamentally wrong. Now, you always have to have the foot on. We're not here to spend taxpayer money poorly. But do you think that we can compete and win if we're focusing on squeezing pennies out of everything? No, we should be willing to trade pennies for time, for that time to market. And so I believe that when you focus really hard on speed and going fast, especially in moves against an adversary, that you can't do that in an undisciplined way. This isn't about making one move, fielding one program, one system. We have to do this over decades, guys. We have to get comfortable. Go ahead and get comfortable in your seat, because this is a decades journey for us that may not end. So speed is going to be the metric that matters most to me. The military that focuses most on cost is likely to lose with more money in its pocket. I do not want to be that military. I do not want to be that Air Force. We have the authority to go fast. I talk a lot about Section 804 authorities, um, which continue to be a, a point of consternation in the Pentagon, but you guys know you're experts. The, the 804 authority we're using to speed up programs, what is, it, what is the thing that really helps us do the most? Is get on contract faster. People like yourself that don't have to wait years, they can go ahead, start thinking through with our industry partners, how are we going to structure our business deal? How are we going to incentivize your performance so that we give the warfighter what they want. Pentagon's lost sight that this is really about getting out of the starting blocks faster. Well, I just want to say, people have done great using the authority, but it's really, about, it's really about culture, isn't it? You can do almost anything with 5,000 if you wanted to. But what I love about what so many programs are doing is they're branding themselves. I'm an 804 program, well, what does that mean? For those that know acquisition, we are in an obscure field. When you say you're an 804 program, it connotes, I'm fast, I'm clever, I'm doing things differently. You know, come take a look at what I'm doing. I love that programs can self-brand themselves as being of this new school, fast, tailored, delivering for the warfighter. So it's again, it's just culture. And I love that so many 5,000 programs have come in to say, I can do it too. I'm gonna be fast, I'm gonna take time out of the system, steal it from an adversary, get it back to the warfighter. So we have the authorities that we need. We are really close to 100 years, really close. Like, I, I checked before I came down here, I think we have 87 and a half on the books, and the rest to get to 100 is in the queue. And that will have been done in less than a year from the start. 100 years taken out, so much of it by people like you, finding a way to pull time in. So way to go, Air Force contracting, that's an entire century that we just stole back from an adversary. 
it's hard to kind of, I mean, a century is catchy, right? We know it's a lot of time, but imagine looking at a timeline chart where all sorts of systems in airspace and cyberspace are, are, are fielding. And imagine being able to tell someone, all right, you can go and shift things 100 years back to the left. Wow, I mean, that starts feeling like a competitive advantage. So hitting 100 is nice, it's newsworthy. It's a good talking point for Washington. You have to manage that kind of thing, knowing the kinds of things that get good press, that, that sell well on the Hill. But that's not, that's not a destination. That's basically finishing the first lap. We will keep going until every program feels tailored to the minimum that's required to deliver. I'm really excited by what a lot of people are doing and smarter sides of acquisition. I'm really excited with what digital engineering is doing, and I need your help, because digital engineering is going to change how we do contracting, how we work with vendors. The programs like GBSD, Ground-Based Strategic Deterrent, that's the Minuteman Three replacement. Uh, I just, I wish I could mind meld with you and give you the experience of using the tools that they're using. I got to sit down, like at a computer, and just in the time I was there, 10 minutes, do hundreds of design trades, like change the requirement, and then see how the performance changed, and then mind blow, see how life cycle costs changed. They've done millions of design trades. I would contend this team knows as much as their industry counterparts about the designs and the impacts of them. That'll change everything about how we do business. This is a new standard. We've got to make the norm, not the exception. So I'd ask you, I'd invite you, please help us think about how the new Air Force is digital first and how we reap the benefits of what modern design brings. Software, awesome. I really thought coming into this job that the pivot to Agile was going to be really hard. And the great thing is that now I have no worries about that. My worries are now related to how are we possibly going to test all of this software and get it certified and get it airworthy. So progress in government is really about moving to better problems, and we've moved to better problems in software. So I think this is another area where when you look at our software factories, so people heard like Kessel Run, that kind of thing, have people heard of this? It's a, I wish again I could mind meld to give you the experience, but just imagine walking in and just seeing a bunch of people in t-shirts coding and thinking, well, this must be a company. And no, it's the Air Force. And those people are airmen. And they are coding with a few industry counterparts. But we look like a software development company. And when you talk with how they're doing business, they're doing it in, in a, a, a manner called DevOps or DevSecOps, so development and operations together. The operators are there. Often, the operators that are there are going to take the code being written like, like, and use it within weeks, which is crazy, but wonderful. It changes the model of how we do business. It doesn't look like a product anymore. It really looks like a service contract where you just have a level of effort, and there are metrics that you use to know, did you code well or not, and what was your velocity, what was your backlog, retirement and management, and I think that's the direction we're going. We need business leaders to think about how are we going to ship more and more and more software development so that it looks more like a service and less like a product. Here's the thing most people don't know about Kessel One. We had to work hard to sell that in Washington because we're still asked questions like how many software lines of code is it? And we don't know. When are you done with whatever version? It depends, right? But we do $150 billion of service contracts and no one, no one really asks about that. We need your help to make people confident in our software development because we can measure it. Help us think through how we build confidence when we're not just doing a few hundred million dollars of software development. What's going to happen when it's billions, when it's real money? So help us skate ahead of the puck on this and try to make people confident because they can see we've got our hands on the reins. So in terms of the tools and the mechanisms, I'm really excited with how quickly acquisition has been able to speed up. I think there is another gear that we have to hit. But I am very confident 
that continuing to delegate authority to the field. And by the way, one of the things I've asked all of our program executive officers, and now I'm going to ask all of you, we did a great job delegating milestone down. Right? We went from having one milestone decision authority to like 90 or so, the ones that we have now. But that got us from AQ down to 06s, senior material leaders. What about the material leaders below them? And then below that, and below that. I'm asking everyone in Air Force acquisition, if you are making a decision, I really want you to question if you need to make it. I want you to feel guilty if you have to make a decision at your level. Why can't it be lower? If we have every person feel like they're not doing their job, if they had to bring the decision up, then we're going the right way and getting power all the way to the edge. Now, I know this can swing too far. It is unfair to people at various points of their career to give them decisions for which they do not have the experience to make. That is your job as a leader, is to know when and where not to do it and where you can. But I have seen in many programs, and it's hit or miss, depending on whether it's in place, where there is a lieutenant or a captain that has responsibility that they can't believe they have. Reviewed a classified program a few weeks ago. The lieutenant responsible for the software development and a captain responsible for the system engineering on a classified program that is going to attempt something that has never been done before. You got an LT and a captain leading it. And when they briefed me on their program, like, they were almost rising out of the chair. They were so excited, so passionate. I'm going to guess that they're going to be in the Air Force for some time with that passion for some time. It's our responsibility to try to get that experience down so that people light on fire with what is possible. So if you're making a decision right now, ask yourself about it. And I will promise you I will do the same. So I'm happy with how things are going there. What am I not happy with? Industry base. And my senior military assistant will probably tell you that a lot of times when I'm in a meeting and we're talking about a future development, I will put on the table, yes, but we're collapsing the industry base, so why do we continue to do business this way? I feel like it's something that's such a big problem, we've got accustomed to it just can't be solved. Right? Where are we on tactical aircraft right now? Two. Two vendors. The early Air Force that Hap Arnold had, I mean, that was back when companies only had one name. You had McDonald and Douglas. You had Lockheed and Martin. <coughs> so the hyphenated name uh, business started in aircraft long before it did uh, trip in, you know, in people's lives. We can't go any further. I worry about the industry base every day. If we continue to bring last century's acquisition system into this, eventually, I'm afraid, we'll collapse to only one. And, you know, in a Monty Python-esque future, you could imagine the whole industry base just kind of consolidating into one big prime that then competes us against the Navy and the Army for its services. <laughs> Let's, let's hope they like our pitch about, about airplanes and spacecraft and cyber. So we can't let that happen. So I tend to start talking about commercial startups first when I talk about the industry base. I want to talk about the primes. I'm working hard in a lot of our next generation programs to look at how do we fundamentally speed up the rate at which we create new programs. The thing that happened in the 80s and 90s is when, when large programs became effectively technology maturation programs that then got manifested on a platform, you could see the, the, the rate is going to have to slow down. The technology is a driving factor. Software was a driving factor, and we didn't have the benefit of all the modern dev tools. So waterfall, that term didn't exist because that was just called coding. And the pace slowed down. Well, you know what that did to our system. Competitions became more fierce. We had to buy a lot of those platforms, or we wanted to, to try to make the business case for the vendor. 
And it became more and more fierce of a competition to where we are today. Competition might be negative in many cases, where it's happening so infrequently that we're forcing these mergers and acquisitions in order to compete because it's a must-win situation for so much of our industry base. We continue this, then this long-term competition, we can have the best people and we can have the best systems, but we are on frail legs if we don't have the industry base start going the other way. Some of the technologies I've mentioned earlier, like digital engineering and precision manufacturing are game changers for this. So hear me on this, Air Force. The way in which systems are built is finally, looks like, can come into the Air Force from something that you might think looks like the automotive industry. Remember when that fundamentally flipped? Remember how car reliability went way up because everything became machine driven. You can see it coming. So I need leaders like yourself, business leaders, to look at those technologies and not just say, hey, here's a good technology. Let me make sure there's an incentive in my program. But we have to pick up the pace at which new programs are created. It is a shame that if you were at a company like Lockheed Martin or Boeing or Northrop Grumman or any of our primes, that you may get to design one system in your career. What's the early Air Force look like every year? New plane, new plane, new planes. Century series era of the Air Force would be an exciting time to be an acquisition. It can come back, but only if people like yourself look ahead and take to program people like me and say, here is a new way we can buy, build, and field that looks more like continuous design and development and less like the MDAP, Major Defense Acquisition Program. We really need to kill that model, folks. The MDAP is killing our industry base. Help me hack the system so we can start growing the number of people that are building our high-end, cutting-edge systems. So that's for help of the primes. We need to build more frequently or we're gonna keep collapsing. What about startups and tech innovators? Well, I want to say this is an area where, unlike uh, Cameron's talk, where he said you may not get the credit for what you've done, most of the credit for what we've done in working with tech innovators falls to just passionate contracting professionals who are sick and tired of having people say the government can't do business at the speed of relevance. The Pentagon is still thinking about the pitch day that we did. Have you guys heard of that, the thing we did with the startups? So, Here's what a Pentagon bureaucrat hears when we talk about that. The Air Force used these credit cards, and eh, it's like Apple Pay, and that's yeah, big deal. It's a big deal. But not because we used a credit card, a government purchase card. Who cares? The big deal, and I wanted to be able to share this with you live, is that in the investment world, we are a no-brainer partner for anyone pushing the envelope. And we don't even realize how big of an influence we can be on the tech ecosystem. Folks, we have billions of dollars of small business funds without a lot of expectations. Our small business innovation fund alone is 660 million a year with very few questions asked. It's money we have to spend for this. And I think we are guilty in the Air Force of thinking that because it's small business, it's unimportant. Right, some of the most important work we're going to do is to plant those seeds well so that companies, as they grow in future, grow in orbit around us, at least until they reach escape velocity and go off and become big commercial magnates. But if they become those, isn't it great that they know us? I think we're a little guilty in this century of thinking that putting money on the table, Cold War style, is going to continue to build the partnerships with tech innovators. There are a few companies who are not inclined to work with us, and maybe we look at it and say it's their fault. But were we there as a potential partner at a time when they could have needed us? Were we there to build that relationship at a time of need? We weren't. We're still sitting behind our high walls, five-sided high walls, thinking that just because we want them to work with us that they will. We have to get outside. We have to be a partner. The fact that we can now move money to a small company instantaneously is a game changer. 
And I need you to think about how to take the game across the Air Force at scale. Put yourself, pretend you, you are a small business innovator, tech startup owner, you got a great idea. And you're thinking, I gotta go around to get money to take my product to the next level because I'm gonna be the next Amazon. So if you go to a commercial investor, you're thinking, all right, how much of my company equity do I have to give up to get the support, that cash flow that I need? Now think about what your world, what your worldview changes to when the Air Force is also part of that investment equation. We have huge resources. Our cash is non-diluted. We're not gonna ask to own equity in your company. We have very low return on investment expectations. And we have a mission that is inspiring. And if you don't think that has value out in the world, I have seen very few companies say, I don't want to work with the Air Force. They're inspired by what we do every day. The biggest thing they tend to say is, I don't know how to work with you. Well, now that we can move cash instantaneously, now we need to think through, how do we make it easy and transparent to work with us? I don't know who the next Amazon is, but if they're out there now, we have to have them connected with us. That cannot be a nice to do, it is a must have. We have got to grow the industry base in the commercial tech world. And that does not mean turning these companies into primes. It means a new kind of company that is commercially focused, but defense oriented as well, where their technology can be used by us, taken to market for the warfighter faster than any other adversary. We need business leadership on this because the pitch day that we did in New York, though awesome, right? anytime you get to follow a company out from a source selection and see money in their accounts in less than 15 minutes, I had chills watching this. It was awesome. Fastest was three minutes which one company said was less time than it took them to get a beer. <laughs> that seems like a great t-shirt for Air Force contracting. <laughs> so true, true ninjas in the contracting world have made that possible. But the whole process to get there is still hard. Please help me hack the system on this. Because if we do, the billions of dollars and small business set-asides and innovation funds are huge. We can be a huge influencer and shaper of the ecosystem. So the technologies that I talked about up front, what's going to be the next big technology in 2030? Is it AI? Is it quantum? Is it bio? I don't know. But that's why we got to plant seeds right now. We need relationships with companies that are pushing them so that if there's a big breakthrough, we're not starting the conversation the next day with hello. We've got to plant seeds now with the huge resources we've been given. If we do this, well, I'm, then I get pretty excited about the last part of the equation. So if we're going to try to do the working with primes faster, more frequent platforms, which is a great idea. I love the idea of the Air Force creating a new system, a new satellite, a new airplane every few years and fielding it and being able to demonstrate that just because the Air Force starts looking fairly heterogeneous, that the sustainment costs don't spike. That is what digital engineering, digital design should do. So family of systems that share a lot of common support, but mission upgrades system to system. So very similar to commercial design doing it here. All sounds great, but anyone in Washington is going to ask, how do you pay for it? And that's like the buzzkill and the innovative talk is how do you pay for it? So another area that we've got to do better is pushing innovation and sustainment, which I knew very little about before joining the Air Force and was asked zero questions going through confirmation about sustainment. 70% of the life cycle cost, 0% of the questions. So who here supports any part of the sustainment or logistics enterprise? See hands. So I've been around it this year amazed. So much creativity. A lot of places that I went to depots and the boneyard was told, you're the first AQ to ever come here. And I'm like, how is that possible, right? It's 70% of our budget and no one came out to see it? It's crazy. I see so much innovative potential there because it's amazing culture, amazing creativity, 
and the best 1990s instantiation of Lean Six Sigma that I've seen. <laughs> Still running off of paper. So I, I think because sustainment has never, I've heard a lot where it's not important, super important to me, but because it's never had limelight, I think we just pay for it. All right, we got the Air Force, got to be able to fight a war. Here's the check we have to cut, 70%, and now we're ready to go fight and win. There's a huge potential to bring in technologies that are used widely in the commercial world. So a lot of them are obvious to everyone, like 3D printing and things like that can make a big difference to us on parts. But just digitizing the enterprise, bringing in artificial intelligence, there is money to be made. But what I need your help on, I, I can get people inspired about the technology. Created a whole PEO focused on just this, it's from General McMurray. And they've done great. They've transitioned 3D printers into depots and additive repair into depots. And we have over 140 AI algorithms that are live today in our mobility fleet, already saving money by predicting maintenance ahead. I can get people excited about the technology when it's pushed from the government in. How do I get industry excited about continuing to pull the cost of sustainment down so we can pump those dollars into development. It's the big pivot that I need business leadership on. Right now, if 70% of our budget is in life cycle costs, I can give this talk 100 times, but if, if I'm an industry partner in the audience, I'm hearing, I, I hear that well, but 70% of what you're spending is in sustainment. I, my business case has to take that into account. Fairly steady, predictable cash flow for me. So you're telling me to shift more of my thinking back into development, but you develop things on decades long cycles. That sounds like a horrible move for my business. So speeding up development has got to come hand in hand with a new model for sustainment where a company doesn't say not doing that. We're gonna have to think radical things in this area. I am up for radical things. I am up for thinking about licensing sustainment back, effectively paying companies just to let us do a more hands-on job. I am up for unprecedented incentives to keep industry pulling down the cost, pushing new technology, new innovation. PBL and performance-based logistics on steroids, I'm up for it. But if, if that company that's thinking about 30 years of contractor logistics support does not look at our new business model and say, well, yeah, it's actually better for me. Right? That gives me enough predictable cash so I can pull my engineers back into design. Then the whole thing's just a talking point. It's a, it's, a, it's a good talking point that no one disagrees with. Yes, we should do better in sustaining 70% of the budget, but it actually can't be done because it has to start with industry saying, that's a better deal for me. I'm up for radical things in this area. The thing that I would like to, um, to close with is just simply a challenge to all of you. It's a challenge that I've given to, to Cameron Holt, and he's gotten close a couple of times, but I'm going to give it to the rest of you. Make me nervous this year. I want radical thinking about how we do business. I want industry to want to work with the Air Force more than any other government partner. I want them to think that their profit is going to be better with us, that their benefit to company is going to do better. But in order to shake out of the old model, I need people that are willing to take risk. And I know that taking risk talking point is a very common one. I've, I've been in the audience and heard leaders I work for talk about, hey, I want you to take a risk. And I was sitting there thinking, there's no way that you do. <laughs> no way that you, are, that you want to go sit in front of Congress in a hearing or in front of your boss and explain why that thing happened, especially, especially in a town that worries so much about what is said by overseers and in media. I am not worried about that, folks. I, if, if you need... If you need comfort before you take a big move, email me. Some people do, and they tend to benefit if they do. If you want to get that top cover, and you don't have to come all the way up to my level if you don't, 
want to, ask your boss, ask your supervisor, I want to try this thing. I want people in contracting to feel that they have Air Force support for doing things that are non-traditional because that's what opens up new tools for the generation working for you that you are training by your example, for them to just come in and think that's how the Air Force does business. So the one thing I wanted to tell you is I hear jokes and snide comments about contracting all the time in headquarters by people that have had no experience doing it. And I am always the one to jump in and say, that is not right, it's not true. Those kind of things are stealing from the culture that I mentioned. I just want you to know I don't have tolerance for them. So think through whatever it is. You know, as Cameron alluded to, the, the FAR and the 5000 series really preclude very little. They're very good at keeping mediocrity from doing bad things, but excellence can always find a way through them. I use the term contracting ninjas a lot in business ninjas just because it's, it's fast to say. But I like the idea of running quickly through, running around, just like you know, ninjas do in movies, past obstacles. So if there is a thing that you have been thinking, boy, I've always wanted to try X, make this year the X year. Try it. And if you're afraid that if it goes south, that you're not going to have the top cover, then please schedule a phone call with me or with Cameron or with your leadership. We have got to get in a in a mindset that risk taking, if you think of everything as a distribution, right, and the middle is the norm, is average, that if you don't have one part of the curve on this side that's having those failures, then you're not having the other side, which are the big wins. We started a new award for good failures. It's called Spectacular Learning Events. <laughs> And I've given four out to programs that tried things that completely didn't work. My challenge to you is the next time I give them out, I would like to have more than one given to Air Force contracting. Try something. If it doesn't work out, make sure we understand what we learned. Now we're a better Air Force because of it. So folks, I'll end by saying our future can be much brighter than our past. We now live in a world where there is so much technology and so much of it aerospace related that we can build an amazing Air Force out of technologies last century never saw coming. But so can any other country. And so my challenge to you, to all of us, is that we never ever let a day go by that we continue to push making today count because competition an excellence in competition is really not stepping back and looking at decades. That's too big for anyone. It's bringing that sense of urgency into the little things, time after time after time. And so focus on the little things. Look to create tools for your people. And with the talent that we have, the competition is really not going to be the adversary eventually. It'll eventually be us. I'm just excited to be here to be a small part of making the pivot.